Dell Technologies end of the year sale is the perfect time to upgrade tech. Save big on the latest computers featuring Windows 11 Pro that easily automate workflows. Don't forget to shop servers, storage, and top brand electronics with savings up to 45% and all with free shipping. Call a Dell Technologies advisor to help you transform your digital workspaces with comprehensive end-to-end solutions. Find the right tech for your business needs at 877-ASK-DELL. That's 877-ASK-DELL. On the 12th day, there is a to me. 12 podcast players. 11 horrible segues. 10 puns of punning. 9 coleslaws eating. Yeah, it's not funny anymore. 8 lifelines throwing. Seven interviews running. Six people whining about fees. Five amazing neighbors. Hey, wait a minute, Richie. Five should be just one amazing neighbor. Think you got another typo, man. Four trips to Bavaria. Did we tell you Joe went to Bavaria? Three trips to the Canadian Rockies. Joe told you he came to the Rockies, right? Two trips to Asia. I'm sure Joe told you all his Southeast Asia trips, right? Wow. He's got to stop that. I'm going to barf. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. <laughs> Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and have you taken a moment to think about lessons learned during 2021? I learned that the depression in the basement floor is not a hidden treasure, no matter how deep you dig or how much Joe yells at you. And that when Joe's mom asks if you have a minute, you should always say you're busy, especially if she's holding a loofah. Since today is also the day Lincoln's Tunnel opened, I have to learn exactly what that is, though I must say I don't like the sound of it. Oh, 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 the Lincoln, the Lincoln Tunnel, not Lincoln's Tunnel. That's far less anatomically disturbing. Anyway, today, to help you figure out what you should have learned, we welcome Clark Howard. And I'll have some tunnel-related trivia. And now two guys who should have learned that even though we work from home, you should still shower every day. It's Joe and O J J J J G. I think that's you more than me. I don't stink. Oh boy. I don't. I I I, I uh. I, I, do you shower every day? I try to. I feel much better than I do. I kind of do it as like a wake up or refresh mechanism, much more than a stay clean uh-huh. uh, mechanism. But uh, but yeah, got to stay fresh. Plus, my shampoo is a eucalyptus smell. Smells great. Wakes me up. Good to go. I don't know where that discussion's going, but let's uh, transition because you know what's going on? Clark Howard here today, OG. All right. Thankfully. It is. Thankfully, somebody that can save this (laughs) train wreck. I am so happy. Clark Howard. If you don't know Clark Howard, you're about to get a real treat because not only is he one of the nicest people in America, he's also so knowledgeable at everything that helps consumers do more with less. We've got that, but first we have a fantastic last headline of 2021. So uh, why don't we get this started right after? And now Clark Howard waiting in the wings. So let's get moving on our headline. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show. Our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Our headline today, and what a great way to finish uh, 2021, because I think this is a lesson for a lot of people this year. A lot of people, OG, as you know, not happy getting rich slowly, looking for how do I, I double my money in five days or less? I think that's a big thing. I was just having this conversation with somebody the other day. I think that this comes from, by the way, the sensation of being behind. If you feel like you're behind, you're more likely to do things that you aren't qualified to do. Yeah. You know, or, or aren't necessary, right? Like trying to hit grand slams when all you need are base hits. Yeah. And I mean, look at Becky and Steven, who we talked to when I was at Camp Fi. Remember that interview started at 50, yep. retired at 60. And did they do any crypto? Did they do NFTs? They didn't do any of it. 
And by the way, it's not to say that you can't do those things. You can do those things, but they didn't do any of that. They stuck to the basics. They built a foundation. They shoveled money into investments with history and, and they made it. So our last headline comes to us from Jason's week over at the Wall Street Journal. You're a big fan of Jason's. I buy his stuff. Yes, I do. Jason writes, meet the kid with two Ds, because that's his last name, who goes toe-to-toe with Warren Buffett. Jason writes, the typical stock fund manager is a sheep in wolf's clothing, passively mimicking the market with only a few small and timid active bets. By taking the opposite approach, Wilmot H. Kidd III has racked up one of the greatest long-term track records in the history of investing. And if you're interested in investing, I know that uh, last week we introduced you to trading for people that want trading. This guy, OG, even though he's buying individual stocks, you could argue is not a trader, is no. not at all a trader. If you invested $10,000 with him back in March of 1974, when he took over, you would now have $6.4 million by the end of this October. The reason is, and this is a key to his success, patience, concentration, and courage. And I want to walk through each of these. So patience, you know, a lot of people talk about owning a stock for three, four, five years. He will buy these stocks, OG, and he will hold on to them forever, forever. He is not a seller. Yeah. I mean, since we're comparing him a little bit to Warren Buffett, Warren Buffett's famously said that you should be allowed to buy 20 stocks in your entire lifetime. So you got to be thoughtful. You got to recognize, okay, this is the one I'm going to hold for the next 80 years of my life. And uh, Warren Buffett doesn't really trade that much either, although maybe as of late, he's added some weird things that, uh, not weird things, weird things for him. Yeah, weird things for him. Different. Capitulated and bought Apple. You know, like, okay, fine. I guess they're going to keep selling computers. I get the feeling too, though, that Berkshire's having, you know, he has now people that maybe the heir apparent under them. I don't have the names in front of me, but these other people that are in the organization, I get the feeling lately that they've had a bigger say in what Berkshire's purchasing. But that's the same thing. I mean, if you're looking at it from the patient standpoint, an earning cycle, we're recording this a few days before we post it. And the stock market's all in a tizzy because who knows what the Federal Reserve is going to do? Are they going to lower rates or raise rates? And that's such a myopic short term view of you know what's happening. You should really pay no attention to any of the daily stuff. And because it gets so in our face, we've been conditioned to think that that's the tempo and frequency in which we should pay attention to it. I mean, if you go back in time, I got to find this. I wonder if Putnam would let us use it. Remember those Don Connolly tapes? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I have them. I need a tape player. Like those of you who don't even know what I'm talking about. I need a player (laughs) of tapes. What is that? Yeah. What's a tape player? Yeah. So I remember distinctly one of these cassette tapes that Putnam Investments would send out had had half of it was a market update and the other half was, you know, kind of like wisdom type stuff. So I remember distinctly in one of these cassette tapes where he went through the history of stock prices and not history as in like, what did it close at? But the history of when you got to know it, if you trace it all the way back, you find that the only reason that the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and and the newspaper started posting stock prices in their newspaper was as a courtesy to redeeming shareholders. Because you used to get stock certificates, right? You'd buy a stock at a company, and someday later, you'd get a paper that said you own 10 shares of whatever, or 100 shares, whatever. And if you wanted to redeem that, you'd have to sign it and mail it in. And then you'd get a check later. So it wasn't like, I wonder what my stop loss is going to (laughs) be. You just said, I need the money now, so I'm going to send it in. So when did you sell stock? When you needed the money. When did you buy stock? When you had the money. Very simply. And so people were wondering what my price might be that I sold it for. So as a courtesy to redeeming shareholders, they published the prices. So you had some clue. Some clue. Ballpark-ish of what what price you might have gotten. And now you get it instantaneously, tick by tick. And that conditioning, it all goes back to media. It all goes back to ads. It all goes back to all of that stuff of if we can keep your attention then we can use that attention for other purposes. And the way that we keep your attention is by saying things like, coming up after the break, we're going to tell you about the new weather storm that's coming. 
or the new, you know, apocalypse du jour that's happening across the world. And, you know, like whatever it is, you have to get through all of that and, and recognize that if you're investing, you're investing for your lifetime and preferably for the lifetimes of your kids and grandkids. If you put that in perspective, you have so much time, it's ridiculous patience is is a real key and you and I last week were talking about uh, Microsoft and Nvidia as a couple stocks that did nothing for a long time but think about how in those cases too if you were a believer Ford. It, what sorry Ford yeah if you were a b- believer I almost said a believer I am a believer you are a believer sure. if you were a believer in either of those stocks and you had patience because you believed they were coming that patience rewarded you handsomely. But you had to be okay with being wrong in the case of Microsoft, I think, for 14 years in a row, right? Well, you know, we get so wrapped up in the average returns, right? You get wrapped up in, you know, when you look at your calculator and you say, well, the stock market averages 10% or 8% or whatever number you want to use, how many times over the last 100 years has the S&P actually closed at up exactly 10%? Never. Never. Never never happens. It's always above or below. And so in order to get the average, you have to be in it for the below average, because there's no way you can exactly get all of the up above average times. So if you are investing, whether it's in individual positions or sectors or just an index fund, you have to be okay with there's going to be periods of time where it's going to be the minus or it's going to be below the average number. Or you're going to look and see other areas or other sectors or other stocks or other whatever that are doing way better. And that's the whole purpose of diversification. If you look at your investment account and everything you have is up the same amount, you're not even close to being diversified. You're doing yourself a disservice. But back to patience and to really distill this argument, Zwieg writes that in 1962, and this is part of what he thinks Kid gets correct, the business historian Alfred D. Chandler wrote that unless structure follows strategy, inefficiency results. And I want to talk about that for a second, because I think this is a powerful line. Structure follows strategy. In other words, the way that you trade your positions follows your overall strategy, which goes to what you and I talk about all the time, which is if you begin by knowing that this is where we need to go, and then we buy investments that historically are for that time frame, that's what creates the patience. Your, your structure, how you're buying and selling is a function of your strategy. And Zwieg then says, most asset managers, strategy follows structure, meaning we trade, we trade, we trade to try to get the hot thing. And then we go, oh, okay, well, uh, this is going to end up being our strategy because we, you know. I guess I'm a tech tech long short fund. Yes, because that's where the momentum is in the market or whatever it might be right now. But I think that's huge. Structure follows strategy. Yeah, and we talk about making sure that you've got the rules in advance because- Uh, This applies to everything. You're not going to make really great financial decisions with highly stressful emotional times. You know, people who tried to make investment decisions on March 23rd last year didn't make great ones. No, they didn't. I mean, I know there's somebody going, I bought a whole, but I backed the truck up on that day. Okay. Yeah. There's one of you or five. One of my least favorite phrases, back the truck up. Because I think that if, if structure follows strategy, but think about the way that you are investing during these downtimes then. Like you're not excited because there's a reason things are down and things are ugly, but you still are in much more of a mindset of take advantage of it at the very least live through it. Right. And stay patient knowing there's going to be a better day ahead because this Under Armour stole my line last year. I should have trademarked it. The line is the only way is through. Only way is through. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's, that's the only choice you can't, it's impossible to accurately predict the ebbs and flows of the stock market. Otherwise, someone would have figured it out by now. If it was something that could be done, somebody would have done it, and that person would control all the money. And so since it doesn't, you don't have any choice either. And if you look at the history, and if you use, like you said, the structure, or I'm sorry, the strategy of saying, I've got 50 years to use this money, then that starts to design well, what sort of investments should I have if I'm investing for 50 years? And then God forbid you add another 100 years on top of that for your grandchildren. His second piece here, so it's patience, concentration, and courage. Let's talk about concentration. You know, 
a way, the way to get richer faster is to be more concentrated. By the way, what that means is you're increasing your standard deviation and realize, by the way, when I say get richer faster, that also means you can get poorer faster, right? So this is not the elixir that some people think it is. Oh, I'm just going to buy one thing. No, but when you have a concentrated position, which is the case for Mr. Kid here, what he was able to do, and I think this is, by the way, over the head of most of our listeners, but if you're trading individual stocks and you're trying to follow 500 things, you're making a mistake. What's cool about him, you talk about buying, you know, Warren Buffett saying to buy 20 things, OG, because of the fact that number one, he's not trading every day. Number two, he's following very few things. Guess what that gives him time to do? Because you don't have time to do everything. He can dive in deep into these companies. He spends the vast, vast, vast majority of time understanding these companies to a depth that 99.999% of investors don't. Mm -hmm. We look at one-year timeframes far too often. We look at quarterly timeframes too often. And Zwieg, Jason Zwieg, looks at his returns over time and whether kid has overperformed or underperformed. And there have been years where he has underperformed greatly. But what's interesting is he held his guns because he knew the companies that he was invested in and he knew his outcome was still a long way to go. So he's able to do that. I mean, even in the trading Academy partnership with Delta, they teach people that are even trading. They teach them to trade one thing, S and P futures contract. That's what they do. They use this mini futures contract because they can buy it in a small increment, right? so that you don't get your butt kicked at first while you're learning, but they're trading one thing and they're learning how to trade that one thing. Well, now the cool thing is you then take it and you can apply it to whatever you want. You want to do this with home Depot. That's fine, but they're going to start off with one thing. And that's the key with kid. And you think about it for a lot of people. I mean, I think this is the magic of when you're first starting out what JL Collins says, and you know how much I don't believe that VTSAX is your elixir as your portfolio grows. But what that does when you begin is that if you buy the total market index, you can think about one thing. I own this one fund. I think that's incredibly powerful. (laughs) I see how you're piecing this all together. I don't know that that's what he meant by concentration. That is not what he meant, by the way. (laughs) But I see how you're applying that. Yes. But you're right. I mean, there's a great benefit in being super concentrated. If you look at all of the wealth of the wealthiest people in the universe, uh, it's all super concentrated, right? It's super concentrated in one particular idea or one particular company or particular theme. The problem with that is, and I don't think there's enough credit here, the problem is is that it's, it's equally risky and probably 2x more risky because if you don't have the ability to take care of your basic needs of like clothing and shelter and financial independence and that sort of thing, then the benefit of being concentrated goes away. It's a big risk when you're an entrepreneur and you have everything tied up in one business model. The benefit is, is when you go, oh, my business just went public or I just became super profitable. But I guarantee, even though Elon Musk or Warren Buffett or Bezos, they have all this money tied up in their individual companies, they also have money outside of it to the extent that can sustain their lifestyle in a crazy fashion forever. That was probably one of the first things that they did was, hey, I've got 10 million bucks. I finally made my first 10 million. And you say, well, geez, if I made 10 million, that would be perfect. In the context of their world, that's a relatively small sum. A whole different thing. I need to make sure that this is, you know, my safe and secure money, you know. Uh, And we do that with cash. We do that with making sure that you have enough emergency money or pay off your consumer debt. You try to cash flow. You'll do it with free cash flow. We we talk about it with side hustles and and rental properties and you know that sort of thing. When you can make it so that your base lifestyle is covered, that gives you the flexibility to do other things. You can't do that in advance, hoping that it gets you to you know the level of uh, lifestyle that you're looking for. It's kind of a juxtaposed position, but um, I don't know. I think. I don't like the idea of concentration because of the fact that the risks are too high. We all see the concentration working very well 
for the people that it works well for. Well, and this is the problem. And this is why I said this is over the heads of most people. What most people want to do, and when they hire financial advice, they want to do this. They want to be concentrated and they want to delegate responsibility for that concentration to somebody else. So what happens? They don't understand their positions. The structure does not follow strategy at that point because they don't even know the strategy. And then the last point, having courage, right? That, that's the third thing that we now are transitioning into that is his win. You can't have the courage when you don't know why the hell you're concentrated. This guy, Mr. Kid, he spends all day, every day diving into the depths of these companies. They don't drive into their financial advisors thing and say, hey, buy AMD, watch it for me. I'm going to go do something else for six months. That's not what they do. So when we think about concentration, I think that piece is over most people's. I don't think that most of us want to do the things that he did to get where he is when it comes to concentration. But the other two things I think are super important. I think we still have to have that courage, OG, even when we, even when we see, you know, markets go down, if we've got indexes, so we're performing in the markets, I think it helps us with our courage. Because it's much easier for us to say, this isn't my problem. This is a market problem. If we believe that society is going to exist and that markets are going to exist, then that's what I'm betting on. And the other cool thing about betting on markets instead of individual positions, they're self-cleaning. When you buy an index, when a company really sucks, it gets removed from the index without you having to do anything. In, in the case of Mr. Kid here, he has to clean his own portfolio all the time, which, by the way, takes even more courage to give up, to give up on a stock. I mean, you and I have given up on stocks before. That is painful. When you have, when you. I'm, a, I'm about to before the end of the year. I've got one dog that is not going to see January 1st. I'm just waiting to see what happens between now and the exactly. end, of the, end of the year. But you've believed in this. You have a lot of belief in this company. You thought that it was the right thing and you're you're wrong. And by the way, with Mr. Kidd, he's wrong. Every year, he's got an average turnover of 11%, which for people that don't know, is a hella small turnover rate when you're managing billions of dollars. Hella small. He's he's roughly one out of 10 positions, let's say, even though it doesn't really work that way. He's turning it over. He's selling one out of 10. And um, man- But, But the other side of that means that on average, his positions last 10 years. That's, yeah- you know what I mean? Like, like when we think about like the patience and the, and the discipline and the timeline, that means that on average, if you're selling a 10th of your portfolio every year, that means by and large, you keep it for 10 years. He's owned analog devices for 34 years. Yeah. He's owned Murphy oil since the time he started in 1974, uh, up till 2018. He sold in 2018. Imagine by the way, it's 2018. He's owned Murphy oil this entire time. I mean, this is like getting rid of your blankie. (laughs) This is the thing that brought you so many gains. And so, and you, by that point, he knows the management team. He knows everything about this company and to sell it, that's courage. So we don't have to deal with any of that. All we have to deal with when we own indexes is the courage to hang in there when things get tough and to buy when other people are selling or, or just continue our strategy. Yeah, stick to the plan. I think that the biggest thing that helps with courage is uh, having a goal. If you know in advance what your purpose is, then you can look past the day-to-day activities. Whether you're on the side of the coin right now that says the market's overvalued and the great reckoning is coming, that doesn't matter if you're thinking about a time horizon of 50 years. What does that matter? You know, or 150 years. If you're on the side of the coin that says the government's going to keep pumping money into it and this is only the beginning of a 10-year awesome time period, guess what? It doesn't matter if you're thinking about a time horizon of 50 years or you're thinking about the goal of, I got to send my kid to college in 18 years from now. I'm always just profoundly interested in looking back over history just to experience or think about the experiences that others have had. My grandfather has been passed away for many years. He was 97 and he turned 40 in 1959. And I, you may know, (laughs) recently had a birthday. I'm slightly older than 40, but grandpa was 40 in 1959. And I was thinking about all of the stuff that happened from the time that he was 40, not the stuff that happened before he was 40, because that was crazy too, right? The Great Depression and World War I ending and World War II, all that stuff. 
But what happened from his 40th birthday on <laughs> until his 97th? It's like, you can't possibly imagine what's going to happen over the next 30 or 40 years of your life. And if you're 20 right now, consider your parents when they were 20 and the stuff that they thought existed. Think about something that is as routine as like OnStar. It's been in cars for 20 years. Try to explain OnStar to a 40-year-old business owner in 1959. <laughs> like, what would you say? It's like the Jetsons, but the Jetsons weren't even out yet. No. <laughs> didn't even know, <laughs> didn't even know space existed in 1959. Did you see the thing, by the way, that uh, I believe George Jetson is born this next year? <laughs> Like in the, in the cartoons, born in 2022. 2022 is the year that he was born. Yeah. Yeah. They missed the mark a little bit on what we'd be doing, but, but I don't I mean, know, man. I mean, we're not, we're not flying jet things, but we are, I remember, I remember watching those going. The sound in your mind. Like that's how they would <laughs> travel. So, someday. I mean, we got robots cleaning our floors, right? We do. That's mine doing right We do have robots cleaning our floors and we have a uh, video, video chats. Those are Jetsons. Yeah. It's not as sexy. But think about this. Think about explaining, Joe. Explain the investment. Imagine you're the pitch guy. Grandpa is a business owner, wealthy business owner, and he's looking for an, he's looking for something a little saucy. That old index fund's not going to do it for him anymore. They didn't have index funds in 1959. And you've got an idea. It's called OnStar. Go. Go. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Check this out. You're going to make a phone call. No, no. From your pocket. It'll be in your pocket, your phone, everything. But that's a whole different thing. But it's not connected to anything. And you're going to press some buttons, not dial anything. You'll just instantaneously connect you to the person across the globe. Yeah. Who will magically know exactly where your car is. How are we going to get the wire into your car? Yeah. Who's going to send a radio signal to a satellite, which is like a moon, but closer and that thing is going to reflect information back to your vehicle and tell it to unlock the car. And this happens in about five or seven minutes. All in. What do you think? How much do you want to invest? <laughs> Sir? <laughs> eh, none. Got to go, space boy. Got to go. Exactly. You've been reading too many of those science fiction uh, things. So when you think about the way that you think about the future, person, the way that I think about the future is to reflect back on the past and how obnoxiously crazy any of this stuff would look at. I mean, we've all heard the story of you've got more computing power in your pocketbook, you know, or in your in your pocketbook, geez, in your iPhone than, than the entire space program had in Apollo 13. If you haven't watched Apollo 13 in a while, go watch it. But watch it with the eye to how they are doing all of the calculations as they're hurling through space. He's doing it on a freaking pencil and paper. He's like, wait a second, hold on. Uh, before we do this life-altering transaction, you know, when I'm pressing these buttons to make that space shuttle fly, let me just do the math real quick. Yeah, I carry the one. Yeah, I got it. He gets out his slide rule. The guy's at the... Anyways. You can I'm even all see around. all that math in Hidden Figures. Go watch Hidden Figures. That's another great one. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Math, not computer. Like no. the computer's not doing the math. They call the people in Hidden Figures the computers. Right. <laughs> so go back in time and look at how silly it is. Pretend you're there till today. And now tell yourself the silliness for the next 40 years and tell me that you can't possibly have faith in the future and you ha can't have confidence that things are going to be a thousand times better than they are today. And then if, if that's how you believe and then you invest that way, how could you ever be wrong? Jason Zweig strikes again here. Oh, gee, and that's a great uh, headline to finish the year on. We will link to it in our show notes page, stackybedjamins.com. Unfortunately, I think you're going to have to have a uh, subscription to the Wall Street Journal to read that piece. Possibly not, but I think so. Uh, we will have other links, though, in our 201. Brooke Miller, who is the amazing writer behind the 201, always includes so many deep dives that go along. Not really a guide to the show as much as just a lot of things on the same topics. StackyBenjamins.com slash 201 to subscribe. Always free, always expands upon some of these wonderful ideas and uh, gives you great curated resources to go get more. But speaking of more, Mr. Clark Howard, if you're not familiar with Clark Howard, he is the gentleman who for a long time started off as a radio host, and you may know this, OG, started off in travel. 
He was the travel guy on a radio station, did so well. They upgraded him and actually gave him a lot more time. And then one day the finance person didn't come in. And because Clark has always been a thrifty, smart person when it comes to personal finance, he did the finance show one day. That ended up being one of the nation's largest syndicated radio shows. Of course, expanded for a long time onto uh, CNN headline news. And he has this amazing global presence. Of course, Clark.com is a place where a lot of people go for resources. Clark Howard about to give us his five lessons we should have learned from the events of 2021. But I know we've got uh, Doug here first because uh, Doug's, Doug's, uh, Doug's got some mystery for us. So gee, let's go. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. Man, I had a lot of questions about Lincoln's Tunnel to talk about upstairs with Clark, none of which I'll repeat here. But now I know it was the Lincoln Tunnel that was completed on this day in 1937. According to untappedcities.com, which I assume is a keg beer site, the tunnel that connects New York and New Jersey is 1.5 miles long, 95 feet underwater at its deepest point, and has 120,000 cars passing through it on an average day. Adjusting for inflation in today's dollars, do you think it cost $1.5 million, $150 million, or $1.5 billion to build? Oh, gee, one more show to go before we head into the... It's like the the last mile of a marathon that I've never run, but this is what it feels like. We've got half of this show and one more show to go. And then we're off on hopefully what is a much more normal Christmas season. You didn't do anything. I mean, you've talked about this. You didn't do anything last year for Christmas. We we went up and saw the parents as a family. We traveled safely, kind of by ourselves. It's funny. This year, we're doing nothing. We we talked about it. We're like, do we want to go? Which is the funny because we're doing the opposite. We're headed. You're doing the flip. Yeah, we're headed back to Ohio. We will, uh, yeah, we'll be there. Last year was a year that my son flew in and, and we had this weird Christmas, the Charlie Brown Christmas yes. with the like the one stick and <laughs> one bulb on it, and one tiny little Christmas tree that we unpack because the house was just completely torn up for being renovated. But you know what? It was still great. It was still fantastic because we were together, and isn't that what it's about? That's what I've been told. I absolutely think so. Navy Federal Credit Union's cash rewards card can help you slay the season while you're out shopping. You can earn up to one point seven five percent cash back on all purchases. When you find up, sign up, find up, I don't know what fine up is, but let's say sign up for direct deposit. You can redeem points as soon as you earn them. Use those for gifts. Learn more at NavyFederal.org. That's NavyFederal.org, insured by NCUA. Everyone likes a great deal, like savings, markdowns, and lunch specials. But when it comes to car insurance, we know the right place to go. State Farm offers surprisingly great rates for your ride. Your friends don't have to have a special connection or even call in a favor. State Farm has options like insuring your ride and your home, getting you great rates on both. Why are these such surprisingly great rates? It's what you get from them. Coverage that meets your needs. Because insurance shouldn't put a hole in your wallet. Those good neighbors are in your corner. No promo codes, no waiting around for holiday deals, and no sales section. State Farm fits your life at prices that fit your budget. So where do you go for surprisingly great rates? It's State Farm. Because like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Call or go to statefarm.com for a quote today. Hey there, stackers. I'm basement treasure hunter and loofah-averse friend of the family, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. The light at the end of the tunnel is here, and it's the answer to today's trivia. Without the internet, without computers, without smartphones, Lincoln himself built that tunnel for an amount that would today equal $1.5 billion to build, adjusting for inflation. Speaking of inflation, the gravitas of this next guest is really going to inflate the dignity of this show. Thank God.
And here to help us celebrate the end of the year, it's Mr. Clark Howard. I'm so honored you're here with us, man. Thank you. It's so cool to end the year, get us ready for a new year, because 22 has got to be better than the last <laughs> two years. Man. Isn't that why we've been through it? Haven't we? We have totally been through it. Well, and you and I were even talking about this upstairs with mom about how our football teams haven't helped either oh. brother, the Atlanta Falcons oh. and the Detroit lions. Are you kidding me? Yeah. We're both pitiful, but you know, we have won five more games than you've won. <laughs> oh, now you're pouring <laughs> salt in it <laughs> <laughs> next year. But I've been saying that my entire life. So, right. I don't know. Just over overarching Clark, what are your thoughts as we close out 2021? I mean, such a weird year. You see Charlie Munger a couple of weeks ago talking about how the stock market to him seems weirder than it was in 1999. And I think right. you and I both thought it was weird in 1999. We've had so much change this year. All this just weird investing patterns. I mean, we started off with meme stocks and all through that, but just generally, what's your thought as we close out 2021? I think I'm optimistic. And the reason I'm optimistic is you think about what life has thrown at us since March of 20 and how versatile we are, how adaptable we are, how we overcome. I mean, you look at us as individuals, how we deal with it, how companies deal with it, and we are more capable of dealing with life's curveballs than we give ourselves credit for. We proved it again and again. And I think about with um, those latest variant, uh, Omicron, Omicron, so, yeah. uh, you, whatever you want to call it. All right, I'll just call it the latest variant. The thing. There were all these predictions how it was going to take the economies of the world and the toilet again, and the airlines were going to have no passengers and all that. It hadn't played that way at all because people learn to live with the circumstances that life presents them. And that's what we've been doing. And yeah, the stock market in the United States is stupid. I mean, there's, and the stock market over time is brilliant. When the short term, the stock market is always dumb up or down. And the values right now make no sense by any rational measurement. So I have been doing a lot of investing outside the United States where the values are much more normal than they've been here. But I'm not leaving the United States. You know, I still have big positions in the United States because the fact that they're overvalued now just means we're going to have reversion to mean. We're going to have lower returns moving forward. Could be, you know, painful declines like happened after 1999 to the NASDAQ. Or it could be just things stay sluggish for many years to come. But where else do you go? Because being an owner of capitalism, being an owner of enterprises is where you got to be for long-term financial security, long-term growth of your money. And yeah, people have had ridiculous returns. If you go back to 2009 through this year, eventually the marketplace says, hey, those numbers make no sense. And it gets back to more normal numbers. But that doesn't mean gloom and doom because people have ended up with these large gains. And just as March of last year, when we went through all these shutdowns and people were predicting that we would have like 1918, 1919, that perhaps 100 million people yeah. would die around the world. Nobody was thinking about modern medicine, modern science, and how we are learning to deal with and treat. I mean, we've had tragic loss in the United States. There were 800,000 people dead. That's terrible. But we are piece by piece, step by step, learning how to live with it. And COVID will be like a seasonal flu. It's not been to this point, but it will be. And commerce will continue. People will get married. They'll have kids. They'll take trips. I mean, we will get back to normal from it because that's what human beings do. We overcome and we endure. And I think that's the message I want people to think about as we turn to 22 is we are going to be fine. And yes, it has been terrible. And if you lost a loved one, you lost a grandparent, whatever, to COVID, it was horrible. And a lot of people suffered loss of income who worked in jobs that shut down you know, March through, I guess, June last year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People now have, average person has more money in their account today 
than they did before COVID. I mean, we do adapt. And that's the thing. There's always people talking gloom and doom, gloom and doom, gloom and doom. We're better than that. And we're going to prove it. And we already have. Well, let's jump in then, my friend, on that positive glasses, three quarters, uh, full note. Uh, let's go with the stock market as our first thing. Stock market, as we do this, <laughs> S&P 500 up about 25% this year, yeah. right? It sounds like the takeaway we should learn from 2021, or maybe that we need to learn or need to remember, based on what you're saying about global investments, investing everywhere, is that diversification still matters. Diversification is key. You know, there are people who have gamblers' personalities, and you look at the amount of money people are borrowing on margin. I get upset for them. <laughs> you know, yeah. that people are borrowing these enormous amounts of money on margin, betting that the market's going to keep climbing to the sky and beyond. And so, why not double your bet and borrow money so you can be in it more? But as we know, when the market turns, it just tears you apart. So investing already in the short term is a bit of a gamble. Long term, it's not. Borrowing money to invest, a gamble, in my opinion, always. And so when people think of investing as being today, part of today, this week, this month, and they don't think long term and they don't diversify, you're creating so much risk for yourself that may look good and feel good in the short term but eats you up longer term. So diversifying internationally, uh, domestically, wide. I'm such a believer in something Chuck Schwab said forever ago. We never hear his name anymore, we do we? We don't, and we should, because so much wisdom came out of that man's mouth. So he's the one who's all about, yeah, uh, you know, you want to play around with some of your money, go ahead. But you start with the base of having well-diversified, low-cost funds first. Kind of like the Bogle idea, except yeah. Bogle would have you do that and nothing else. Right. And that's fine too. But what I keep seeing, particularly with younger investors, is they're doing these big bets and they're doing them on very narrow sectors, even just a couple or handful of stocks. And that scares me. The options trading that a lot of uh, younger investors are doing right now, it really concerns me. My dad was a professional investor. He had worked on the four of the New York Stock Exchange as a kid. And in the 80s, he got into doing options trading. He thought, this is going to be great. I'm going to make a fortune. Then uh, this is ancient history to most people, but Black Friday happened oh, yeah. with the stock market in 87, 40% drop in value. All the options got wiped out. He lost a lot of money. He never did that again. So you got to be careful every time you try to leverage a bet and narrow the options you're doing. I'm never into betting on the fifth horse in the fourth race. I want to bet on the overall picture, and that makes me dull. And I admit, I am the dullest person alive, but I like to have money, and it really <laughs> works to be dull and steady as you go with investing. I am the turtle with investing. More fun to be dull when you have cash. Yes, More it fun. is. Yeah. Well, right. well, and here's another question. As you're talking, I'm thinking about the change, not just in 2021, but the last uh, two, two and a half years, this change now to zero fee brokerages, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and we see this gambling mentality at the same time. And I can't help but think that one kind of led to the other. Are we having some unintended consequences of the fact yeah. that fees are zero? So people feel right. like they can bet with no consequence. Well, Robinhood did something great democratizing investing that you could be anybody with any amount of money and you could invest. It's like so much of American society since 1978, this movement towards deregulating things, opening everything up. We have this endless series of choices now, and it is definitely democratizing. You look at air travel, go back before it was deregulated. Only the wealthiest could ever get on an airplane. There was like no air right. service. The government decided when you fly and all that. And we opened it up and, you know, the marketplace opened up. You can take industry after industry and stock trading. If you go back then, it was only for the very wealthy because a trade was like 400 bucks right. and not in today's dollars. It was $400 right. in the dollars back then to do a simple trade. And so when you get the freedoms we have 
with the financial market, with most anything now, comes with it a process you have to go through where you say, well, just because I could do that, maybe that wasn't the best idea. And so people are going to have to make those mistakes. They're going to have to learn because I'd rather people have the freedom of the marketplace and learn maybe I shouldn't be uh, betting on all these cryptos or maybe I shouldn't be buying uh, stock in GameStop or AMC yes. or whatever because I'm going to make a zillion percent in the next six hours. But people should have the ability to make those decisions, make those choices. Were they good for them that they could do this? A lot of people have shown that wasn't the best idea for them. You know, it's funny you say that because as you're talking, I'm also thinking about how excited I get about people in their 20s talking about investing, right? And maybe to your point right. in the wrong way, but the fact is maybe once they touch that stove and they get burned, then they'll, then, I mean, it's way better than where I started with, which I learned about credit card debt at an early age, which was right. bad. I think we already got just in a couple sentences there, your view of our next topic from 2021 which is the rise of crypto and NFTs. And your disdain, it sounds like, though, is on the betting. So let's not talk about the betting because I feel the same way. But what about the technology and the yes. fact that with NFTs now, we have this exciting way to prove ownership and make the system maybe work better. Do you like cryptos and NFTs from the technology standpoint? 100%. From the very beginning, when Bitcoin was first a little baby, I loved the, I don't like how much energy it uses to produce. That, that's upsetting to me. But the underlying architecture, the blockchain technology, the ability to break the cartel of the banks in movement of money around the world, where these very large money center banks, both U.S. and overseas, are able to basically take a cut. They're almost like bookies, where no matter what you want to do, the banks are in there messing up the free market, taking a ransom of every transaction that happens. So I love the underlying architectures we're talking about because it cuts this inefficient, backwards, I mean, just terrible intermediary out of the system. What will come from this, it's almost like you mentioned the 1999 stock market thing. Yeah. And there were all these crazy ideas, companies that were losing a lot of money. And people were, the more money they lost, the more people were paying for their stocks. But what, came out, right. but what came out of the dot bomb was all the great technology companies of today. So out of this era, that is this wild west, 1849 gold rush kind of thing with the NFTs and the cryptos, what will come out of it is a better, more democratic payment system in the United States and in the world. So I think it will have a very good result. But the reason I, I just pick on crypto so much is the idea is it's an alternative way of having money. You want stability in the value, but people are playing the cryptos as a gambling thing, a speculative thing. And so the values go crazy up and down every day. If it's an actual real form of payment, you would be able to use it to buy things <laughs> and sell them. And it would have a value that you could trust for more than the next three minutes. And so we are in that early formative stage. We're in the pioneering stage of something that's going to be very useful later. But right now, it's just like a carnival sideshow. Yeah. Next up on my list of events from 2021 Man, this last quarter, the inflation number came out uh, yeah. about a week, week and a half ago. And obviously a lot of this is supply chain related, but inflation, I think for some of our younger listeners, this is the first time they've seen this, right? Uh, uh, per prices. Yeah, and I went to the grocery store last week and bought, I felt like I bought nothing, Clark. I felt like I bought right. nothing, spent 170 bucks. Well, I shop at Aldi. If you're familiar with Aldi, yeah, it's yeah. where really cheap people like me go and buy their groceries. <laughs> What's terrible is I go into Aldi now and it's crowded all the time because of the inflation in the supermarkets. People are just pouring into Aldi and their smaller U.S. competitor Lidl. They're both German companies. So there's not as much merchandise available because so many more people are buying it. And I'm having to wait in these longer checkout lines. I mean, I got to get rid of this inflation so I can have my <laughs> Aldi and my Lidl back because 
it's really frustrating. But you look at the supermarkets and there's two stories going on. You have the regional supermarkets that are having trouble stocking their shelves and the price points are going way up. And then you've got Walmart, which accounts for like 22% of groceries sold in the United States. And the inventory levels in their stores are great. And they have been willing to sacrifice margins, profits, to hold the prices down. So the gap now with Walmart and the regional supermarket chains is the largest it's ever been in price. Mm. And so people are, a lot of people look at grocery shopping at Walmart as trading down. People are trading down, but they're finding the inventory and they're finding the much lower prices. And this is, this goes back to what I was talking about earlier. People adapt. People find out how to deal with unexpected, unhappy circumstances. When the cost of one thing in the supermarket is too high, you buy something else. And that's how we adapt as humans. So the other thing is the Federal Reserve caused a lot of this, and the Congress did as well over the last two years, pumping so much money in the economy. Federal Reserve keeps signaling they're going to stop it. They're emptying the punch bowl. And a lot of the inflation that has been produced by too much money being out there in the marketplace, the Federal Reserve has the power if they act soon enough to dial that back and get the inflation under control. And the supply chain that has fed into inflation, piece by piece, the supply chain haphazardly is going to steadily get better through 22. We're going to see dramatic improvement in some industries in the first half of the year. And I think overall, we'll see meaningful improvement by the uh, third quarter of 22. And so you have these two things, too much money being thrown in and the disruptions from the distribution system, both feeding inflation, third factor we haven't talked about yet, and that's the great resignation. But two of the big drivers of inflation are things, thank goodness, that are going to come under control. When it comes to, I want to get to the great resignation here in a second, but before we go there, if the Federal Reserve does start to move, it certainly seems to me, I mean, obviously it's going to be an interest rate move upward. Is this another ringing bell that if we don't have a debt strategy yet, you'd better get one. Like if you've got debt now, Clark, I have this feeling that, man, the interest rates on every single thing you buy are going to, are going to go sky high. Yeah. So I just did this on my podcast we were talking about it. Was I being Daddy Clark or was I being Uncle Clark? <laughs> Nagging people about their debts. And with the variable interest rate debts, like uh, credit cards, yeah. personal loans, that they're going to get their clock cleaned if they're running big balances on variable rate debt because and home equity lines as well with the floating rates because they are able, by the terms of the deal with you, typically on 30 days notice or within one billing cycle to raise the interest rate by whatever formula they're using. You're just going to see the amount of money you're paying in a month that was going towards interest and the amount going towards principal much more heavily go towards interest and less is going to go towards principal. So this is a fair warning. You want to do everything you can to reduce your credit card debt, any debt that has variable rate. The other side of that, when I was in debt, the thing that made me angry and made me want to get out of debt quicker was I didn't like being an asset on somebody else's balance sheet, right? Sure. I did not like that. But let's talk about this. Seven point something percent I bond right now, right? I can get yeah. I can get seven percent from the government where six months ago, if my savings account was paying half a percent, I was awfully happy. How do you feel about that? I've been singing the praises of the I-bonds ever since it became clear that we were going to go through a six-month cycle with an effective rate of over 7%. And it's going to take a while for the inflation to wean out and you get the rate of inflation. You get no return beyond the rate of inflation but because you get 0% on your money plus the rate of inflation. But it's going to be a good holding for one year you forfeit some time period, but more for a five-year period likely holding those series I savings bonds are going to be great. So I've been telling people, Hey, how many kids you got? We got two. All right. So you can buy 20,000 there and you buy 10 for you. You're married. You got another 10. You got 40 grand right there (laughs) earning 
a much higher rate of interest than you can earn anywhere else right now. Absolutely. Fantastic. Let's go to the one that you mentioned, the great resignation. We have a lot of businesses struggling, but we also have a lot of people going, you know what? I think it might be time for me to make a move, make a change. What's our lesson right. here with the great resignation? Well, see, I'm thrilled with this because management has had too much power over labor in the United States for about the last 40 years. Effectively, you know, we talk about the income inequality, the spread in money in people's hands, the owners versus the workers. Now supply and demand is out of balance. There is more demand for workers than we got workers. And this is an opportunity that we haven't seen in two generations for workers to be able to boost their pay. It was just the other day, I think it was Hobby Lobby boosted starting pay minimum to $17.5 an hour wow. and a number of organizations to 20 an hour now. This is good stuff. I mean, people worry that this is going to feed inflation. The reality is the pie has not been sliced to labor in an equitable fashion for a long time. And if you just sit where you are, your employer likely isn't going to say, you know what? I just love these people who work here. Let me give them a lot more money. <laughs> and that's why people are hearing from a friend, hey, I just got a new job here, there, everywhere, and they're paying me this much. And you're like, wait a minute. I'm smarter than that person. I'm a better worker than them. And I'm making a third less than they are. I got to go test the market. And I, I think that's what you got to do. It's brutal if I'm a small business owner. Yeah. Because when you think about where people are heading for the exits the most, it's from small businesses that can't have the benefits and generally the pay of larger enterprises, not necessarily the giant companies, but at least larger ones. That forces them to either make do with a fewer number of workers or to pay whoever remains more money so they don't go away as well. The last thing I have on my list, I have one more. We just had tornadoes rip apart America. We've had some horrible things happen here. I remember talking to a documentarian maybe five years ago who was talking about end of life, and he had this wonderful, horrible phrase that, that destruction doesn't happen at the end of your story. Things always happen in the middle of your story, and that you never know when things are going to happen. And I know you've always had strong feelings about risk management, about what to do with insurances, about kind of walking that tightrope. What's our lesson from 2021? Well, first of all, to the people of the Mid-South, and especially the people of Kentucky, that was incredibly horrible. And I was in Joplin, Missouri, after the uh, horrific tornado there doing radio and TV, when I had never, with my own eyes, seen destruction like happened in Joplin. And it's the same kind of picture just spread over more miles with what hit the Mid-South and parts of Southern Illinois. My heart just aches for those individuals who lost loved ones, for the loss of all their possessions, having to put their lives back together. The insurance equation is what seems always missing when the reporters do stories about these, that uh, particularly the renters tend to have no coverage. It's very rare for renters to have coverage. And renters insurance is dirt, dirt cheap, typically 10 to $20 a month, a little more, a little less. That's something that I want is I want renters to get coverage. Homeowners often complain about their homeowner's insurance premiums and don't have enough coverage. They'll have really low deductibles, but not enough coverage. You want to have high deductibles on your homeowner's insurance. So you only make a claim for catastrophic things, but a lot of coverage there to help you rebuild when that becomes necessary. You heard me say when, not if. Because yeah. over the course of a lifetime, odds are our number is going to come up at some point. And it's not the lucky lottery. It's the unlucky. So you have to be prepared with the proper homeowners and renters insurance for the unexpected. A great, I think, uh, takeaway for all of us. Well, let's somehow try to turn that frown upside down to end this in this piece. It's always an awkward transition for something just that puts a pit in your stomach like the events of the last couple of weeks have. But, but if we're going into 2022 now, we've talked about the five lessons of 2021. Thank you so much for that. But if you're setting people's mindset on next year and where really where our head needs to be, Mr. Howard, where are Mr. you telling Mr. Howard, nobody calls me <laughs> Mr. 
<laughs> Were you just trying to insult me? I, I am just plain old Clark. That I gotta tell. <laughs> I gotta tell everybody too. I accused you of drinking earlier, and we're. <laughs> I just like <laughs> nothing more fun than poking Clark Howard. And by the way, I was telling somebody the other day that hadn't seen this. Uh, and for people that don't know this, when Clark went to the Super Bowl, my favorite, my favorite piece of social media was uh, Clark has a picture of him at the Super Bowl. And he is, rather than going to the concession stand, he's a reusable bottle at the drinking fountain because he values the event, but he doesn't value a $15 cheeseburger. And oh, You are so right. I never <laughs> ate or drank anything other than the water I brought when I was at the Super Bowl. And maybe if I would have bought those concessions, the Falcons wouldn't have caved to the Patriots, but <laughs> it was all your fault. I do? That's like yeah. putting your socks on the left one first, then the right one. If Clark would have right. bought the damn cheeseburger, <laughs> no, everything would have been fine. <laughs> but I think that's great. Spending money on what you value. I think that's a good takeaway that I've had from being a fan of yours for so long, but going into 2022, Clark, right. Uh, uh, right. Where, I'll tell you, I'll yeah. tell you what it is. People don't really grow till they're tested. And if I'd say there's something that's happened the last two years, we have all been tested. I mean, just look at uh, the anger problems we're having on airplanes with people deciding they're in a boxing ring instead of on an airplane. And the way people are driving, people are not driving as well as they were. It's all anger and frustration coming out of people. But what will emerge is people will learn that they have dealt with extremely difficult circumstances for 22 months and they're going to be fine. And you go on with life and we are going to be fine every time through humanity, no matter what has been thrown at people, we do find how resilient we are. And so I think as you think about the new year, obviously we want 22 to be better than 21 or 20, but ultimately we're going to be better because we have had to overcome. And that's what I'm so optimistic about is we are more capable than we ever give ourselves credit for. And I will believe that to my dying breath. I would be remiss while I have you here for just a moment to not mention the awesome podcast. It seems to be really, really fun. I mean, it is so fun just follow, following you on the podcast for people that have never heard. I don't know who's never heard the Clark Howard show, but tell everybody about the show. Well, you know, I did a syndicated radio show for 20 something years. I was really getting worried that we were not getting young ears anymore. And I want to reach people in their teens, twenties and thirties, where I can try to help them develop lifelong good habits with their wallet. With radio, the average listener now in talk radio is like 68 or something. So, and I can say that because I'm 66, I can say that. <laughs> but what we do with the podcast is geared towards a younger audience to make good decisions with their wallet day to day and over time so that you have independence. You know, remember a few years ago, everything was about financial independence, retire early, the yes. fire movement. Yeah, sure. And that kind of faded into oblivion as a popular culture thing. But the idea of the financial independence, the first two letters, is what I'm really about, is that you, by making choices where you live on substantially less than what you make, you then have so much power in your life and what happens with your life. I mean, money's not everything, but money gives you the freedom to do other things. And that's why I'm so excited to do the podcast. I saw stats not too long ago that our number one listenership in that time period was people 18 to 24. That's awesome. And I was like, so thrilled about that. That is fantastic. Because that's who I want to teach. I want to reach. I want to teach. And I am the dullest person alive. You just got to know <laughs> that. But the, the result of my dullness is that people get to have a lot of fun in their lives. <laughs> That's the goal. Listen to the dull man and <laughs> great fun things happen to you. <laughs> And that's why I, I love ending the year with you, Clark. And I, I also got to tell you that my brother 
you know, he's like, oh, you got this podcast. It's fine, whatever. And I remember the first time that you and I were about to talk and I told him, I said, yeah, I'm going to be interviewing Clark Howard. He's, You're going to have Clark Howard on you. All of a sudden my show became something because I talked to you. So, uh, there, so your brother is dull. Like I am, he has no life. <laughs> That's what he's excited about. I'm saying my brother's a smart human being, my friend, very smart okay. human being. And by the way, we will link to the Clark Howard podcast or you just find it wherever you're listening to us now, just hit pause, go subscribe to the Clark Howard podcast, because you, you can hear already how much fun you're going to have listening to the tall guy, Clark, uh, have a happy new year, my friend, you and too. a great 2022. Hey, thanks for having me on. This was really fun. Hi, I'm David Stein. When I'm not talking to other people about money on Money for the Rest of Us, I'm stacking Benjamins. Huge thanks to Clark. I love that guy. Just a fantastic human being and uh, wonderful. I feel so honored that, uh, that we get to have great people like him on the show. I also feel honored because we've already recorded Friday show. We do those live on Fireside. This is our last recording of the shows of 2021. OG, great to spend another year with you, my friend. And, okay. Uh, Pretty marginal with you, but it'll be all right. <laughs> it's so great. Keeping it real, yo. Keeping it real. Mm -hmm. uh, here's to bigger and better things in 2022 for all of us. And um, yeah, hope everybody has a fantastic rest of your holiday season. Next week, of course, you'll hear OG and I as we are diving into our favorite financial independence, retire early episodes. We've got five of them for you, one every day. So don't you worry. We've curated some fantastic stuff from the vault. Got to say a big thanks to all the stackers out there. Last but not least, if you are looking to make better financial decisions, time to get on the calendar for 2022, to have more courage and to think bigger about your goals. You and I sat in a session. Remember sitting in Chris Cofield's session at FinCon? He said this brilliantly, OG, in his session, surround yourself with people who think about you being able to do more than you do yourself. And he said it more succinctly than I just said it. Mm -hmm. But surround yourself with people who think you can do more than you can yourself. That's what great advisors around you do. OG and his team ready to help you think bigger in 2022. Head to stackybenjamins.com slash OG for a link to their schedule to see how they can interface with you to make better decisions and to think bigger. All right, everyone. Friday, we heard what Clark said. Let's hear what the roundtable says on Friday. So much fun we had recording this live on Fireside last week, OG. Can't wait for you all to hear it. Let's go stack some Benjamins. Doug, what should we have learned today? So what should we have learned today? First, we learn things this year. Sometimes it feels like life is just whizzing by, especially as a tech bro whizzes by on what looks like what would happen if a motorcycle mated with a skateboard. It's good to stop and remember that each year brings with it the lessons that give you the benefit of experience. Second, everyone's gone through some kind of financial hardship, and what matters is that you learn from it, grow through it, and help others later down the road. But the big lesson? I've never been in Lincoln's Tunnel, but it sounds like an important part of our nation's history. I've also heard it's kind of gross down there. Special thanks to Clark Howard for joining us today. You can find all things Clark at Clark.com. And you can also listen to his podcasts wherever you listen to finer podcasts. This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC. Copyright 2021. And is created by Joe Salcihat. Our producer is Karen Rapine. The show is written by the brilliant Paulette Perhatch with help from Joe and Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast. Know how I know how brilliant Paulette is? She wrote the words I'm reading right now. While she's not putting awesome words in my mouth, she helps writers power their work and businesses power their words. See how she can help you at thatwriterpaulette.com. After you listen to our show, check out our show notes page and the 201 Deep Dives, written by our website manager and blog editor, Brooke Miller. You'll find all things money at the 201, our newsletter, at stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. 
Once we get all of this goodness bottled up, it goes over to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart, who helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. Want to talk about the show later? Mom's friend Gertrude is our social media coordinator and room mother in our Facebook group, The Basement. So say hello when you see us posting online. Here's a weird fact. She and Tina Eichenberg are never in the same room at the same time. To join all the basement fun with other stackers, type stackingbenjamins.com slash basement. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, saying until next time, spray and neuter your pets. We were talking about uh, cassette tapes earlier today. Uh, do you still have any cassette tapes, by the way? I don't think so. I, I did, but when we moved, a lot of stuff yeah. went away. A lot I of still stuff. Have, I still have a number of things on cassette tape. I don't know that I have a cassette tape player, but I feel like for a really long time, I'll be able to find one if I ever really want one. But um, you were making fun of me. Uh, you were saying, you know, something like, oh, gee, you know, makes mixtapes of... <laughs> of Don Connolly and plays them for Mrs. OG. So when I was a newer advisor, all of the stuff that we had was on cassette tape, like all the sales training, all of the, (laughs) all of the stuff. Right. And, and we lived in Ann Arbor when we were dating. That's where I worked. And, and our family was in Northern Michigan. So we would make that trip back and forth quite a bit. And I would venture to say that, I can think of the um I can think of the guy's name who did the sales training, but um but there was kind of a weird intro on every tape, like a weird like musical intro. And I guarantee that right now, if I grabbed her and pulled her into this room and played that intro, she would know exactly what it was from. And she groaned. She probably knew the American Express scripts <laughs> better than <laughs> I did by the end of our first couple of years of being <laughs> together because yeah, that's what I would listen to. Besides books on tape, because I did a lot of driving, books on tape and these like, you know, sales and marketing things, you know, that were yeah. some of them pretty hokey, some of them pretty good. That's when I got into Zig Ziglar. Zig Ziglar, which by the way, he has, uh, he's passed away a long time ago, but um, there's a podcast, a Zig Ziglar podcast where his, I think it's his son takes snippets and goes, hey, let's listen to Zig talk about your belief system. Or Still let's relevant. Talk about term- Still oh relevant. God. You know, and his, he was obviously a great sales professional, but before that, and if you know who he is, this will make a ton of sense. He uh, was a Baptist preacher. So that kind of jives with his canter and demeanor. It and, connects the dots. I never knew that. Yeah. I never knew yeah. that, but of course he was. 